several years ago, and uh, Danielle handed them an invitation at their door. She was riding around in the, in the stroller, and she wanted to go with me, and that was to the point right when she started being like, no, I want to hold those invitations. The issue is that she'd chew on them, she'd throw them everywhere, and I'd keep picking them up, and finally she just decided I'm going to get out of the, this stroller and start walking, so the first person she handed her invitation to was Brother Jan and Miss Barry, or yeah, Brother, Brother Barry and Miss Jan, and uh, we're thankful that they're here. Now, Acts chapter number 9, verse 23. So real quick, I know I didn't speak last week. We had our, our guests in last week, and they were blessing for us. And uh, we weren't even intending for them to be here. You know, it was uh, the, that week prior, he just messaged me and said that they had a cancellation. And um, then said, can I just come out and be a blessing? So we said, sure. So they just came out. We weren't even intending for them to be here or singing for us. But uh, So I didn't speak last week, but a quick recap of where we, we have been and Chapter 9, we saw the conversion of Saul heading to, uh, on the roads to Damascus, where he was heading to persecute and imprison and murder. And we see that he started to preach right after that. You know, so after his salvation, the Apostle Paul, uh, we have many uh, new or baby Christians in our church. And I just, it, it always excites me because new and baby Christians, they're always excited to share their faith and the love that Jesus had for them. Uh, with others. I remember when I first trusted Christ and I began inviting as many people to church as possible and people started coming and they, they were trusting Christ and I had an elderly man in the church in Georgia where I trusted Christ at and he said, you know, it's good that you have that excitement. Give it a couple of years, it'll level out. And I looked at him. Now, in my mind, I was thinking, how many people have you brought to church or told about Jesus in the last five years? I would rather myself be young and energetic in giving the gospel out than being a uh, seasoned, mature Christian after 30 years and not giving anyone the gospel. And um, you now I looked at him and I said, well, I like the way I'm giving the gospel versus the way you don't give the gospel. And I was like 15 years old and needless to say, he was very offended that I said anything. Uh, you know, put my foot in my mouth as a teenager. I, I've, I've learned to bite my tongue a little bit better since then. But yeah, not much. <laughs> but Luke chapter 6 before we read that, Luke 6.45, it says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasures of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. It says, For the, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. So we understand here that the Apostle Paul had something in his heart he just couldn't contain. And it began to flow out of his life and everything he said, everything that he did, everywhere he went. Paul just felt this compulsion, the same as Peter did the day that he ended up giving his life for the gospel, the same as this pastor in this closed access country that we're going to help get out of prison. He had a compulsion to share the gospel with as many people as possible because he knew, hey, what Christ has done for me, I can't help and contain it in my life any longer. What David Brannard said, I I care not where I go or how I live or what I endure so that I may save souls. He said, where I, when I sleep, I dream of them. And when I wake, they're the first in my thoughts. You know, if Jesus is truly, if Jesus Christ truly be God and he died for me, then there's really no sacrifice I can make that's too great for me that I can do for him. And this is where the Apostle Paul was at. Acts chapter 4, verse 20, it says, for we cannot but speak these things which we have seen in what, in what we've heard. You know, the Apostle Paul, and just like Peter and just like these other disciples, there was this compulsion, something deep down inside of them that they just could not contain themselves anymore. And they had to share it with as many people as possible. You know, I, uh, all over the country, especially in California, you know, I've met so many people living in California that complain about California. I think at one time or another, we've all complained about California, Okay. I'm pretty sure we've all been there. Do you want to know why California is the way that it is? It's not because of the world being worldly. The world's always been worldly. The problem is, is that we as Christians have decided to hide and not share the truth of the gospel and not have this compulsion, compulsion to declare it to others. 
You know, we talked about that a little bit in our connection class this morning and, and how the world will be the world, but we as Christians are meant to be different from the world and declare the truth. And the world's the way that it is, not because the world's worldly. The world's always been worldly. The, the world's the way that it is is because we've had Christians who after time after time after time never stood with this compulsion in their life to say the truth of the gospel to everyone around them. So let's pick up here, read this passage in verse number 23. Verse number 23, it says, And after many days were, f- were, f- were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But they were lying awake, was known of Saul, and they watched at the gates day and night to kill him. And the disciples took him by night and led him down the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he assayed them to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him, believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto him, unto them, he had seen the Lord in the way and he had spoken to him. And now he had preached boldness in Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming and going out of Jerusalem. It says, and he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians. But they went away and slaying him, went about, what, went about to slay him. And which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. And verse number 31 is the last verse we'll read. And it says, And they had the church rested throughout all of Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord, in in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. Let's pray this morning. God, I pray that you help us this morning to be able to understand the importance of working together and the teamwork that took place here and being able to have this compulsion to share the gospel to all people around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, verse 23 again, it says, and after many days they were fulfilled and the Jews took counsel to kill him. And their lying wait was known of Saul and, would, and, and they were at the gates that day and night to kill him. So we're going to talk about the, the ministry of teamwork here. Now, the apostle Paul, he went out and he could have easily declared the gospel and said, that uh, I'm going to do what I'm doing no matter what anyone is going to do around me. And by the way, we need as Christians to declare, uh, you know what, I'm going to stand for the truth of the gospel regardless if any other person stands around me. You know, if we only wait for people to stand around us, we will not go very far for the Lord in declaring truth. You know, so Paul here has decided, I'm going to stand and I'm going to declare truth, even if these people don't believe me. But there was this ministry of teamwork here because if it wasn't for those around him, he was going to be executed. So we see this in verse 23 again. Let's read that again. It says, In many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him, and they laid a weight and was known of Saul. And, but their laying a weight was known of Saul. And they watched the gates day and night to kill him. So we see, number one, there's a reality of his, perse- of his persecution. There's a reality of persecution here that as the Jews continued to listen to the Apostle Paul, they well, he's not the Apostle Paul yet. He's still Saul. But as he's declaring the truth of the gospel. At first, they didn't care. They were like, okay, you know, maybe he got a little bit of too much sun. A little, maybe he's a little dehydrated. I mean, he, he went blind. No one else saw anything on the street. It was just Saul here. But we see there was a reality of this persecution. Why was he being persecuted? It wasn't, he wasn't being persecuted simply because he was a Christian. And newsflash, the, the many, there were many, many Christians. There are other Christians in this country uh, that we're helping this pastor today. There are over uh, several hundred believers in this country, but he was arrested because of declaring the truth of the gospel. They, he wasn't arrested because he was a Christian. He was arrested. He, they wanted to kill him. They wanted to kill this uh, Saul here, not because he was a Christian, but because he was declaring the truth of Christianity. So we see this reality of persecution comes because of his doctrine. You know, doctrine does matter. You know, I've met a lot of people who says, well, just come to church. It's okay. No, there is a truth and a false. There are, there are true doctrine and there is false doctrine. Yeah. In many churches, we try to intertwine true and false doctrine for a, an ecumenical, uh, all-in-favor type setting, but we understand that doctrine matters. Yeah. You know, you don't, get, you don't trust Christ. You don't go to heaven because you were baptized. Baptism is a symbol of an outward expression of an inward decision to trust Christ. Being baptized is just getting wet. But there are people who teach that baptism saves you. Now, doctrine matters. 
Now, Ephesians 4, 11 through 14, it says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. See, you can't edify the body of Christ unless you have the truth and everybody's in agreement of that truth. It says, and it says, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slide of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. You know, the truth of the gospel often offends people. It offends me sometimes. I'm the one that reads it. And that's like, oh, that was tough. I I didn't like that. But it's the truth of the gospel. It's the truth of the Bible. And I have to understand that truth. You know, that's why uh, we decide, we we desire to do one-on-one discipleship. We want people to understand what the Bible says. And like I said, many Christians come to church, we sit down and we don't understand the truth of the Bible. We don't know Bible doctrine. And because of that, as we see in Ephesians 4, it says we're tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. Because the, the, the slide of men and the cunning craftiness, they lie in wait to deceive. You know, if a pastor stands up on a television broadcast and, a, and says that uh, I, I'm a Christian and I believe in Jesus Christ, but say, do you have to trust Jesus Christ to spend eternity in heaven? If, if they're not willing to declare that truth, they are a false teacher. And many, many times we see the, the world loves false teachers. You know, false teachers are easy. It's easy on the ears. You know, it, it's easier to listen to that person because they don't always give the full truth of the gospel. But the reality of this persecution was coming because of his doctrine. He declared the truth to all of these Jewish, uh, all these religious Jews at this time and told them, you know, the Bible tells us there are going to be false churches in latter days. There are false churches today. But a believer ought to be so grounded in doctrine that they won't fall to compromise. That they, Every Christian in this room should be to the point that if I were to stand up and say something false or say something wrong, everyone in this room should be able to say, Pastor, that was wrong. Yeah. It's sad that we, we're not really at that point in society in America because we hear something, we say, oh, Pastor said that. That's really good. Well, what Bible backs it up? Oh, I don't know, but he said it. And it just sounded good. You know, we always love to take stuff verses out of context, don't we? Uh, I remember I had a conversation with someone and they, they said, uh, they don't go to church. They haven't been to church in an extremely long time. They don't read their Bible. They don't serve the Lord or anything. And they said, well, it's a hard time. But the Bible says every, all things are going to work out for good. Where do you get that from? <laughs> Can we read the whole verse or the whole passage? To, it says it's going to work out for good to them that love God or are called according to his purpose. And by the way, God's good for our life is different than our good for our life. Our good for our life, man, if it was good for my life, I'd have a million dollars right here. But God's good for my life isn't the same as my good for my life. We love to take verses out of context through false teaching. But the Apostle Paul was persecuted because of his doctrine. Yeah. 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 3, it says, Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. It says, Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and, of, and doctrine. For the time will come when they shall endure sound, they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap themselves, heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Now, yeah, there are many, many people we go to church and we hear something like, man, that was good. But was it true? You know, we see the apostle, uh, the apostle Paul here, he was persecuted because of his doctrine. He was also persecuted because of his dedication. You know, the Bible says after many days were fulfilled, which means that Saul was spending time here, and at first everybody's like, okay, this guy's just nuts. Maybe he's going to get some rest. Maybe it'll fizzle out, much like the gentleman told me as a teenager that it should fizzle out. They probably thought Saul's passion was going to fizzle out, but it, it didn't begin to fizzle out. He began to preach and declare the truth of the gospel, and they bit their tongue and waited, and then after many days were fulfilled. Okay, after there was some dedication that took place here, the Bible tells us that after many days were filled, Saul was so consistent in his ministry, he just wasn't a flash in the pan or a bottle rocket that shot in the air and let off a bright light and then fizzled out. This was something that his conversion, it was genuine. And, it, it, and, and the effect of that conversion, it caused him to continue. You know, many people are okay when somebody finds religion. You know, it's like, oh, you found religion? Good for you. I hope you become a better person. It's when you start going to church, it's like, didn't you go to church last week? 
Like, that's a little excessive, don't you think? You, what do you mean you read the Bible? You pray too? That's a little excessive. And then you begin to share with your family. Uh, I, I had no problem with a lot of my family. They had no problem with me going to church. It was the moment where I started giving them the truth of the gospel to everyone else where it caused the problem. Because people don't care if you are a Christian. They care if you are a dedicated Christian. Because what does society say today? It says, well, just believe what you want. Don't, don't talk to me about it. I think we gave the illustration a few weeks ago how the, a pro golfer went and golfed with Billy Graham, and he said, oh, I don't need religion shoved down my throat. Come to find out, Billy Graham never even mentioned the gospel. He was just bothered because that was another preacher there. The, the, the world isn't against Christianity. They're against dedicated Christianity. And we live in a life where it's, uh, well, I'm in America. I don't have to live a life dedicated. You know, Galatians 1, verse 17 and 18, it says, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were the apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, and I abode there 15 days. See, there was some dedication that was taking place in the apostle Paul. When we become dedicated Christians in our spiritual life, when we become dedicated in our spiritual life, there will be persecution that comes with that because the world doesn't like dedication to Christianity. You know, Russian, in Russia and other, many other closed countries, Christians are tested by hardship. They're tested by hardship. They can be arrested or thrown into prison. They can be executed. But in America, we're tested by freedom. <laughs> now, a, a testing by freedom, I would think, is much harder. And people are like, what do you mean? Well, testing, a testing by hardship in these closed countries all around the world, that would be easier than being tested by freedom. And and I say that because attesting by freedom is much harder. Nobody pressures you about your religion. Nobody forces anything on you. We become so relaxed that we're not concentrated on Christ now. And our, we're not focused on his teaching and, and how he wants us to live. And we kind of fizzle out and step back and there's no dedication. Being tested by freedom of Christianity has, has come to a weak sense of Christians in American society. So when we complain about California or we complain about the upcoming election and whatever happens in the, in the election, or we complain about the country. No, it's not the world being the world. It's the Christians not being Christians because we're no longer dedicated. We can spend many, many times coming to church and sitting down, but if we're not living a dedicated life to the truth of the gospel, we aren't facing persecution and we're not going to be living a life dedicated to him or true, what true Christianity is meant to be. So we see here, number one, the, the, pers- the reality of persecution. Let's look at this next passage, in verse number 25, it says, Then the disciples took him by night and let him down in the basket. So we see here the Apostle Paul stood for truth, and he was like, I'm going to stand for truth regardless if anyone's going to stand with me or not. Now, if somebody wants to stand, that's great. I'm going this way. If you guys want to stay here, that's fine. You can stay here, but I'm going that way. If anyone wants to join me, that's great. But if you're going to get in my way, just get out. I'm going to go forward for Christ. So we see here, the, number two, the rescue of the disciples. You know, a new term that everybody likes to use is snowflakes. Everybody's a snowflake, okay? Um, everybody's a snowflake. But the thing is, is that we as Christians are snowflakes. It's like, what do you mean? I don't mean it in the way that the po- politics use it today. Snowflakes are most uh, naturally a fragile thing, okay? You take it, it melts instantly the moment it touches your hand. But just look what it does when it sticks together. We lived in Chicago for a while. I lived in Chicago for five or six years, and everybody here, you get a half an inch, a quarter an inch of snow on the ground every two years. And I drive down the road trying to go to the store. Last time it did that like a year and a year and a half ago, and it seemed, it was a madhouse trying to go down the road with just a quarter of an inch. Everybody starts stopping. There are people swerving all the road, and I'm, I'm used to going like 60 miles an hour through snow. I'm like, just get out of my way. I need to go where I need to go. Because being in Chicago, you know, you got 12-foot high snow drifts. You're digging yourself out the house. And that didn't stop anyone. You got four feet of snow packed on the roof of your car. You're, you're running late for work. I'd, I'd go out there, and instead of scraping all the snow off, I'd take my, my, uh, my ID, and I'd scrape this little bit of a hole right in the front of my dashboard. And that whole car is covered in snow and ice, and I'm sitting there like this looking out this little thing because I need to go to work, okay? Everybody's used to it. School shuts down. Everything shuts down out here, but out there, everybody's used to it. You know, when the snow begins to pack together, it, it begins to form something that's, that makes an impact. We as Christians, and 
we come together, we can begin to make a bigger impact. That's why the importance of church and spending time and fellowshipping together, that's why the last several years were so hard through COVID and the lockdowns of the church. People need the fellowship and the, the, the communion that comes working together with each other. So it says in verse number 25, it says, the disciples took him by night and they laid him down on the wall in a basket. So the disciples at night, they decide, we're going to help the apostle Paul. Paul knew he was going to be executed if he walked through those gates. So they're standing at the gate. They didn't know where he was in the city, but they're coming to get him the moment they see him at the gate. So I'm sure the apostle Paul was trying to think of how he was going to get out. And then I'd like to always picture this as they get to the roof and all of these uh, all of these disciples, they put together this wicker basket, and I like to picture it as one of those little, little picnic baskets, and he's curled up like this in the fetal <laughs> position, and he's going down, and they're dropping him slower and slower, and it's not a smooth drop either. I'm, I just imagine the disciples are trying to let him down, and all of a sudden, they, it slips, and he drops about four feet, and he's like, hey, slow down. I don't want to die by them. I don't want to die by falling either. So in my mind, I'm picturing him trying to get down, and he finally gets down and he takes off running and he goes to the next place to be able to continue to declare the truth of the gospel. Now, what would have happened if the disciples weren't there to rescue him? He wouldn't have made it. And so the disciples, they took him by night in the wall, down the wall in a basket. And we see that as Christians and as pastors and as leaders in our church, as they go and proclaim, we see that it's not just me as the pastor or Brother Chris is the treasurer, or our deacons, or our leaders in our church to declare the truth of the gospel. That's for all of us to declare that to, to everyone. But how is it that people in a church can help one another when, when the pressure is intense? And you know, sometimes, have you ever felt like you're doing it all alone? We've all been there. It's like, you've got to be kidding me. It's one thing after the next, after the next, after the next. And we're like, I just feel like I'm all alone. I feel like I can't do it. Now, I listed a couple of baskets that I think are beneficial here. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 1 verse, or 1 Thessalonians 5, 25, it says, brethren, pray for us. So in this rescue of the disciples, I think of the basket of prayer. Uh, there's, there, there's nothing that we can do. There, there's more you can do after you pray, but there's nothing you can do until you pray. And we all like to take that into our consideration, our own control. And prayer is one of the most undervalued and underrated parts of our Christian life. By the way, ever since we started our prayer ministry, where somebody's praying every month, I'm so thankful Ms. Gina heads that up and gets all the prayer requests down, and she works on all the calendars. But ever since we started that, and we have a person, uh, one person every day praying for our church for one hour, every day somebody's praying for the needs of our church, we have watched the Lord continue to just bring people into our church and grow. You know why? Because we often neglect prayer. There's more, there's, there's more you can do after you pray, but there's nothing you can do until you pray. Prayer, the, the, the prayer power has never been tried at full capacity, I don't think. We say, oh, I pray. Yeah, we, if you time yourself, you'll realize how much you actually pray. And, you know, if we want to see the mighty works of God's divine power and grace that wrought about through weaknesses and failures and disappointment, we have, let us answer God's standing challenge when he says, call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Why is it that we don't see great and mighty things? Why is it that we don't see God bless our life as, it once, as, as what God once did in the book of Acts? Because we don't use that basket of prayer. A praying church is one of the greatest assets a person can have. If you have a need, we should be able to go to our church and pray for that. The work of ministering to people is difficult. It's difficult for all of us, and one of the places the greatest attacks here is against those who serve him faithfully. Life is fragile. Handle that with prayer. Pray for one another. So we see there's a basket of prayer, and then we see there was a basket of encouragement. I assure you to know that he doesn't have to scale that wall by himself, and he had a group of people taking him down. That was encouragement to him. Now, 2 Timothy 1, verse 16 through 18, it says, Lord, give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for, the, for he oft refreshed me, and he was not ashamed of my chain. But when, I, when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. And the Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And how many things he ministered unto me in Ephesus, thou knowest very well. So he said refreshed. He said he refreshed me. That word refreshed, it means to make cool or to relax. 
You know, encouraging words are like a drink of cold water on a hot day. You spend time and you're, so you're going and going and going, and then you finally get that encouragement. You're like, oh, thank you, Jesus. I needed that encouragement. You know, I had a pastor friend call me uh, this past week, and he, was just, he just got to his church, and he was just kind of discouraged about a couple of things, and he sat on the phone. It was like an hour and 10 minutes, and he's on the other side of the country, three hours time difference, and uh, he called me at 9 o'clock. Uh, so it was really late where he was, but he wanted some encouragement. Encouragement's like a drink of water, cool water on a hot day. It's going to be refreshing. It's cooling. It relaxes. Encouragement's like peanut butter. I said it before. Encouragement's like peanut butter. The more you spread it around, the better things stick together. And as a church, you need encouragement. And when we work together and encourage one another in their spiritual walks, hey, what'd you get out of your Bible reading this week? You know, that might sound a little tough for us, but it encourages us. And helps us walk and knows that somebody cares about us. And by the way, I want you to know that on a regular basis, those who attend our church, those who are members get prayed for on a weekly basis. Those who, are, those who attend our churches, they get prayed on a, at least a monthly basis. Uh, maybe it want twice a month. You're being prayed for by our leaders. You're being prayed for by the church. You're being prayed for. You're on my prayer list. And to be an encouragement, we see that we need prayer and we need encouragement for one another. Don't ever feel like you're in this alone. There are people that care about you and want you to succeed and continue on to the rescue of these disciples. And then we see, I think the most, one of the most important was the basket of labor. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9, it says, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. By the way, this building is not the church. This isn't the church. We are God's church. The church can burn down and we'll still just, we'll just meet in the field and get rid of some of those tumbleweeds and we'll have church out there. The church, the buildings don't matter. No, there's a basket of labor. Now, what would have been one thing to pray for and encourage and say, oh, the, all the disciples, oh, you're, you're, you're going to be killed. Don't go down there. I'll pray for you. Oh, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure you can make it down that wall. You, you got it. Go do it. I'm going to be over here. And that's the version of I can pray and I can encourage. I, I am not laboring. I got delicate hands. I can't let down that rope. You know, yeah, get some gloves, yeah. <laughs> but we see this basket of labor. You know, as a church labors together for the furtherance of the gospel, there is this ministry of teamwork to get the gospel to everyone in our community. Believe it or not, if you were to focus on it and actually try and talk to people, there are many, many people that you talk to every day who's never even set foot in church and never heard the gospel. Why is it that we don't see people coming to Christ? Because we're not laboring. By the way, when we labor, we begin to understand the focus, the importance, the purpose of a church. It's not to come and get entertained and just say, oh, that was a good message from pastor. Yeah, I'm, okay, let me go. I, I talked to an evangelical pastor here in Southern California. And he's, I don't think people understand. And mind you, we... We don't agree, we don't operate our churches the same way, but he said, I just don't think Christians understand what the word Christian means anymore. I said, what do you mean? He said, those same girls that get up and sing praise and worship, they, they go out and they, they were drunk on Friday night. Those same guys that come into church and tell them how much God loves and they go and live a wicked lifestyle all week and they come to church on Sunday. You know why? It's because we're not laboring together. We don't understand the purpose. You know, a preacher in Atlanta several years ago, he Years, years and years ago, more than several years ago, because it was Yellow Pages, he noticed uh, one of the sections in this Yellow Pages. Yeah, who uses Yellow Pages anymore? <laughs> but he noticed in this book, uh, in this Yellow Pages, he was uh, this preacher, he, he, he saw an ad in there that said Church of God Grill. He's like, Church of God Grill? Okay, so he was browsed by the, what the name was, so he decided curiosity got him. He called them, and this preacher, he said, he said, hey, how did your name get that unusual restaurant? And the man was like, well... You know, a, a little, we had a little mission here, a little tiny church here for a long time, and we started selling chicken dinners after church on Saturday, on Sunday evenings to, to, to pay for the bills that we had because we just didn't have anybody. Well, people just liked our chicken so much that, uh, that w eventually we just cut out the service altogether and just opened our restaurant, and we just kept the name that we opened with, so hence we have Church of God Grill. It's like, really? Did, did you forget your purpose as a church? You know, we see that we, we lose focus on what Christianity truly is, and we lose focus on, we can't lose focus on what God has, has decided for us. And many people today were, were crippled with this idea that the pastor and the leadership and the deacons and the hired staff and those here uh, overseeing stuff, they're the ones to do the work while the members sit back and watch. 
but that we're crippled with that mentality, but that's not what happened. God's pattern is for every member to be actively involved, actively serving, actively witnessing, actively giving, and using their talents that God had given them to glorify him by serving one another. But we see that we're so crippled by that mentality today. And like, why would I labor? You know, if it wasn't for these, those laboring here, the Apostle Paul would not have made it. So we see this ministry of this teamwork. Then we see, uh, lastly, number three, we see the return to Jerusalem. So verse number 26, it says, And when Saul was come to, to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but, he was, but they were afraid of him. They believed that he was not a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and he spoke, spoke to him and how he had preached boldly in Damascus in the, the, the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out into Jerusalem. And he spoke, he spake boldly the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians. And they went about to slay him, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. And they had church, the, and then had the churches rest all throughout or rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and working in the fear of God and the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. So we see, number three, this return to Jerusalem. So in this return to Jerusalem, we see some terrified saints here, okay? They, the, the members of this church, they did not believe Saul actually was converted. They're like, oh, this guy's a, uh, a wolf in sheep's clothing. It's like, that man was just the one who was coming out he just killed my family. He just arrested my sister. We even threw, him in, threw her in prison. You expect me to believe that he's a Christian now? You know, I'm sure that they had this thought in their mind that they, they, didn't, they, they didn't receive this report of his conversion with rejoicing. By the way, when somebody trusts Christ and their life is changed, we ought to be able to rejoice about that. When somebody comes and trusts Christ and they get baptized, we ought to have excitement for that. I'm thankful for the baptism we have last week. I'm thankful that we have another one to do today. But when people come to Christ and their life is changed, we ought to be able to rejoice about that. You know, they were more afraid that this was a ruse to identify some of these Christians uh, and throw them in prison or put them to death. But then from those terrified saints, we see this testimony of Barnabas. So his name is Barnabas, and that was the name that he was given. His name means the son of consolation. So what is the son of consolation? Well, consolation means encouragement. Going back to part of this working together, this rescue, he, he was a, consolation means encouragement. He was the son of encouragement. He was one, the disciples gave Barnabas a name because he helped, and he, he helped and he was an encouragement to them. Maybe we determined to be in, an encouragement to those in our church and the fellow laborers coming together. You know, it's very difficult in serving the Lord. You think that you're doing it all yourself and nothing's more refreshing when you serve the Lord and you're doing something for the Lord and somebody comes up to you and is like, man, I'm so excited where you're at. I'm so excited that you're growing. The worst thing you did that. You know, when we have this experience as all as Christians, as Christians we come and we want to serve at the Lord and we need encouragement and Barnabas was that encourager. He was one that wanted to encourage his fellow laborer. So because he was always an encourager, and when he came and was able to stand and say, hey, Paul, his life was changed. They believed it. Why? Because it wasn't somebody that just always had something negative to say. He was an encourager. He wanted to go out and tell everybody, encourage them all in their spiritual walk. And then from this testimony of Barnabas, we see the telling of the gospel and uh, through this return to Jerusalem. They went and told the gospel. It said the church grew. You know, David Livingston wrote this, and he was a missionary to Africa. He said, after witnessing to a band of people who had just murdered some foreigners, David Livingston wrote, he said, I had more than my ordinary pleasure of telling these murderers of the precious blood which cleanseth from sin. He said, I, I bless God that I've been conferred with one so worthless, the distinguished privilege and honor of being the first messenger of mercy that ever trod in these regions. Like, wow. He counted that as, I get the privilege of telling the gospel. So again, we notice God uses different circumstances, and it was all to one end. It's like, why, if, if the apostle Paul was trying to do good, why is it that people are waiting to kill him? Should, shouldn't God have just made it easy for him? I'm trying to do good. I'm trying to do these things for, for the Lord, and now you're setting these people in my path to try to kill me? You've got to be kidding me. 
And we live our lives saying, this, this should be easy. But God was using something to continue. And we see that we, we notice God using different circumstances, always to one end. It's the spreading of the gospel. That was the whole purpose. Everyone who came in contact with this church was revived, what received a witness of Jesus Christ. Somebody showed them the gospel. Paul was taken to the Mediterranean Sea village uh, of Caesarea, and there he declared the truth of the gospel, and then the church in Jerusalem continued to grow because of something he was going through. Because there was a group of believers that said, I see the persecution, but I'm going to help rescue you and give you a basket of encouragement, a basket of prayer, and we're going to labor together, and we're going to go and spread the gospel to every other person around us. Oh, it wasn't the Apostle Paul that delivered himself. It was the disciples who rescued Paul from Damascus. He wasn't going to do it himself. He couldn't do it himself. It wasn't, it wasn't the Apostle Paul who took, him, who took himself to Caesarea. The disciples took him to Caesarea. You know, that, that saying, teamwork makes the dream work, is more people hear the gospel and more people are actually laboring together in encouragement to pursue the gospel to every single person. This was the essence and the purpose and God's plan all throughout the story in Acts. And if we looked at the book of Acts, we can see that that is the whole essence of the story. That we may go through something, we may stand for the truth of the gospel and we may face opposition, but then we see that there are people around us willing to encourage, willing to pray, and willing to work together. Why? For the furtherance of the gospel. That's our purpose. When we understand that this is a lost and dying world and they need to hear the truth of the gospel, it begins to change everything else in our life that we begin to think is important to us. You know, it, what's important? What's important to ourself? And it ought to be giving the gospel to people. It'd be a shame for us to spend eternity in heaven and knowing that not a single person is, is in heaven today or receive forgiveness of their sins because I wasn't willing to share that. I wasn't willing to labor. I wasn't willing to encourage. I wasn't willing to pray. Teamwork makes a dream work. You want to know how a church continues forward? It's because of those disciples working together for the furtherance of the gospel. Let's pray. God, I pray that you help us this morning. Lord, help us to understand what the importance of teamwork and the ministry of teamwork and coming together and serving you. And I pray you never let us feel like we're alone. God, we're so thankful that we have a church willing to come together, willing to encourage and willing to pray, willing to work together in labor. God, I pray that you help us to be a church that is willing to go and pursue for the furtherance of the gospel. Pray that you help us to live a life that says, God, whatever you want me to do, whoever you want me to encourage, whatever you want me to be, Lord, I just want to do that. I want to be that. God, I pray that you help us to have that. With every head bowed and every eye closed, we stand to our feet as the piano begins to play. You may be here today and you say, Pastor, I'm here today, and sometimes I just lack in laboring. You know, sometimes I just, I come, I sit down, and I'm encouraged, but sometimes, you know, I don't always pray for people as I ought to. I don't always encourage those as I ought to. I don't always labor as I ought to. Pastor, I just want to be here, and I want to help move the gospel forward and, and as a team. Would you pray for me? Just, Pastor, pray for me. Raise your hand. Say, Pastor, pray for me. I, I want to be a person who continues to get the gospel out. Amen. Hands all over this room. I, praise the Lord. I encourage you to come to this altar and pray and ask God, God, help me to have a heart, a teamwork to get the gospel. Would you come today and pray at this altar? Maybe you're here today, and you say, Pastor, I'm here today, but I've never had that kind of conversion that, the, that, that Paul had. I don't know if I died today, I go to heaven. Would you pray for me? Just slip your hand and say, Pastor, I don't know that if I, spend, if I died today, I'd spend eternity in heaven. I don't know where I'd go today. Would you pray for me, Pastor? Just raise your hand. No one's looking around. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Amen. No hands up this morning. That means that all in here profess to trust Christ as their Savior. I'd encourage you to come to this altar today as a church and come and pray and say, God, help us. Help us to understand the purpose of a teamwork. Help us to understand the essence of getting the gospel. Would you come today? Amen. Many, many times we come to church and we sit in the service and we hear something, we're encouraged, but sometimes we just lack the initiative to sometimes even apply it to our, to our life. You have no idea how much of an encouragement it is when you go to someone and let them know you're praying for them. When you ask them what it is that they're in need of. I think sometimes we as Christians have lost the, under, the, the true essence of what being a Christian is because of our culture that we have in churches today. 
come and pray at this altar? morning. God, we ask you to help us to be a church that works together to declare the truth of the gospel. God, I pray that you just give us this compulsion as Peter and Paul and all these disciples did of declaring the truth. God, I pray that you help us to be a church that sticks together, unified in declaring the truth to everyone around us. I pray that you don't allow a day to go by where we're not actively serving you and we're seeking your face. And God, we're so thankful for those in our church who help in prayer and encouragement and in laboring. Lord, not everything is done in the church by one person, and Lord, we're so thankful for those who are willing to serve you. And God, I pray that we always keep the end goal in sight of declaring the truth to others all around us and spreading the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Real quick, we're going to sing a quick song while we wait for our baptism. So you may be seated for right now. Um, we are take, doing our Lord's Supper tonight. So tonight, it's not, we're not, we weren't going to do it this morning. So tonight, be back for our evening service. That's at, that's at 5 o'clock, and we're going to be doing our Lord's Supper. So come and join us for that time, and uh, we want to have that together and being able to have our Lord's Supper and taking of the our Holy Communion. And uh, we're going to go ahead and sing our song. Brother Chris.